we'd like to introduce uh, Joellen Hyman Weber. Oh, I, might, I messed that up, didn't I? Weber Hyman, there we go. And uh, she's the manager of uh, the Weber Farm Store. And uh, Weber Farms is a sixth generation Wisconsin century farm that's located in Marshfield, Wisconsin, and since 1904 has been delivering the finest, freshest dairy products from their Holstein cows for six decades. And the Weber's Farm Store has been in operation since 1955 and offers a full range of dairy products and um, with us today, we have Jo Ellen, who is going to be sharing some pieces of that family history, a little bit about the store and their products. So with that, uh, Jo Ellen, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Lissa. Is that how we say your name? Yes. Lissa. Well, I'm Jo Ellen Weber Hyman, and I got a story to tell you. Um, I do have to tell you that, um, I'm very proud to be part of this today, and I thank you for asking. Um, I'm the fourth generation owner of Weber's. My great grandparents purchased the farm in 1904 and started a delivery service with horse and buggy in the local Marshfield area in milk cans. So you can see that up on the screen, uh, my great grandpa and the horse and buggy. And um, this is really what started the whole scene of, of Weber's. After working for his dad, my grandpa, John, purchased the farm and expanded the crops and the livestock to support a growing delivery service. He eventually moved away from horse and buggy and delivered with his truck. He delivered his milk in glass bottles. And we do have his glass bottles. They're in quart size um, that is very unique. I was very lucky to get one of those bottles. Um, when my parents took over the business in 1955, I was just three years old. Um, they founded the business now called Weber's Farm Store. They suspended the delivery service and started up a drive up window where the customers actually, it started out, they would bring their own bottle and my mom would fill their bottle. And eventually that had to change because of rules and regulations. Um, my parents uh, purchased glass bottles for the customers and that's how um, the milk was stored in the glass bottles and the customer, it would be, a. Uh, um, they would purchase a bottle for a quarter. And when they wanted to come back, we just exchanged with a, a bottle full of milk. Um, but that was a lot of work. Um, having glass bottles, you just didn't fill the bottle. You had to disinfect the bottle and then fill it and then cap it. So that was an all day process. And so um, my parents kept kept on thinking, okay, there has to be something better in life. And my father had heard about plastic pouches. So in 1973, technology took over and that's when my parents switched over to disposable plastic pouches. This is what we still have today. This allowed them to cut back on manufacturing time and use that time to advance into different varieties of milk, not just whole milk, 2% reduced fat, 1% low fat, uh, skin milk, and 2% chocolate milk. And, um, and then just in my story, I'll talk about the other flavors that we started. So the plastic pouches was, uh, it was economical, practical, you could use that outer bag um, for other uses. I still, to this day, will freeze vegetables and I'll reuse that outer bag for many uses. Um, also, the storage of the plastic film, it actually starts with a roll of film and our poucher actually forms the milk bag as it fills and and seals it. So um, 
the storage isn't as large as, as it was when we had glass bottles. We also had breakage. Breakage happened off and on, and once in a while a customer would clang the bottles in the car and anything that's awful to have sour milk in your car in the summer months. Um, the drive up still exists today and we actually started the delivery service once again in 2005. We delivered to many businesses as far away as 50 miles. Um, Weber's Farm Store is just like any other business. We had many ups and downs. Growing up on the farm and being part of the business my whole life, I have not been surprised by the demands of agriculture and serving our community. I was expected to get up before school and milk cows and also after school. I helped with crops and didn't know any other way of life. I missed many school functions and had opportunities limited elsewhere. But that is not uncommon for a child growing up on a family farm. We were expected to pitch in and help where needed. This developed a good work ethic and definitely a business that I am very proud of. When my parents were ready to sell the farm, my brother actually bought it. That didn't work out for him. But my husband's family was actually approached by buying it after my brother decided to sell it. This was hard on me. I had moved on with my life. I established a career, went to school as a surgical tech and worked at the Marshville Clinic that I was very, that I enjoyed and was very proud of. After some consideration, the Hyman families did decide to purchase the farm and the business. I believe this was because it was a good business opportunity, but also an effort to keep this business in the family. For that, I will always appreciate. The Hyman families decided that it would be best for me to come back and run, and run Weber's Farm Store. I've been out of the family business for quite some time, but it was like riding the bike. I just jumped back in and I have enjoyed watching the business grow. That was in 1995. And I'm not sure if I could ride that bike anymore, but at that time I did. It's a lot of work. All of my family members have pitched together to make this work once again. It is now owned exclusively by the Hyman families, but I am the link between past generations and future generations of Weber's Farm Store. I came back in 1995 as a manager. The one thing I told the Hyman families was that I was not going to be driving tractor and milking those darn cows again. My days for that were over, but I was willing to manage the store. And at that time, it was a small 500 square foot store, very small. Almost all of our products were from the farm. We had milk, juice, meat. We also had cheese from the cheese factory and did, some, did get in some small items like eggs, butter, ice cream, candies to meet our customers' needs. I like those pictures of the, the different stages of milk bottles. Um, so if you uh, look at the far right and you'll see the quart bottles, that's actually my grandpa's bottles. And I was fortunate enough to get one of those bottles. Um, and up on top in the middle is my mother and she's waiting on a, a customer that was very dedicated to our family and coming out, she had a large family and purchased the milk from us. On the top left actually is the milk bottles that as a child, I filled and capped along with my siblings. And in 1973, when I talked about us starting, my parents starting the pouches, 
that picture on the left is actually the design of the milk bag that they created um, in 1973 with the pouches. In 1996, that bottom middle picture with the cartoon cow was our design after we purchased the business, we thought, you know, we're gonna just give it a little uplift, just make it a little bit different. And we thought with the cartoon cow, it would entice children to drink more milk. Um, and it did show, I mean, our business is growing. On the far right on the bottom is our most recent outer milk bag. And I just recently updated that over a, about a year, year, year and a half ago, when the nutritional facts changed in the industry. Um, and we decided to each milk be a different color for identification for our customers, but also for our employees that are working in the store. Easy to recognize, easy to identify. So, As I go on, I do have to say, well, I must have done something right, or I'm just, I'm just good at bullshitting because the business grew. In 2009, we felt that we could no longer meet the demands of our customers in a small store, and we built a new larger store. It's too bad we underestimated our growth, because once again, had to build on in 2015. The store now is roughly about 3,500 square feet. Now that's a lot of bullshitting in my eyes. This allowed us to expand and diversify our inventory. I can honestly say I listened to my customers and I was going to do everything I could to be sure that they got what they wanted from our business. In 2014, we decided that we needed to grow as a farm and we purchased another farm west side of Marshfield so we could expand more on the farm side. We named that farm Hyman Holstings. Now, why did we do this? We had over 300 and some acreage on the home Weber's farm store site. We were right alongside the city limits. We had an elementary school alongside of our business and we had condos below the business, a tech school, a college, and on the other side of the business, there was a golf, golf course. We couldn't grow anymore. We were to our peak. And so for us to grow on the farm side, we needed more acreage we needed more cows. So that was one of the reasons why we expanded. And the milk that is at Hyman Holstein's is trucked to Weber's where that's where we actually manufactured the milk for our business. Our excess milk we don't use at Weber's goes to Nasonville Dairy. Now the list of items is much larger than the original list when my parents started the business in 1955. The inventory list has grown to roughly over 200 products. We continue to manufacture products from our own cows. Our milk is A2 protein milk. This comes from genetically selected cows through DNA testing to produce the milk we use in the store. This milk can be consumed by individuals that have lactose intolerant. We also produce kefir and heavy whipping cream from our milk. Our award-winning kefir was added in 2013. And during the holiday season, we make some awesome eggnog. And we also just added flavor milk. We added our strawberry milk, which you see on the screen, and we just added some mint milk. And both of them are a great hit. So we're expanding on our items. Just over, um, now besides our regular flavors, we, 
we also started with soft, um, besides our regular flavors of soft serve, we've been doing this for over 35 years. Over a year ago, we started with more flavors and we have a monthly flavor for our soft serve for our customers to purchase and also in many varieties when they come to our store. We also have Cedar Crest ice cream also. Most of our cheeses come from Nasonville Dairy. Also, we have various distributors that we order from. Roughly, we have about 150 cheeses. Our fresh cheese curds come from daily from our store at Nasonville Dairy. We also flavor some of these cheese curds to give a different variety at Weber's. Now, I didn't do this alone. We all know that farming is a business done in collaboration. We need strong families, exceptional work ethic, and ability to adjust to the ever-changing egg markets. I depended on my help of family. We have also have had many high school girls help me in the store. I am proud to say, although they may not have grown up on the farm, they had quite an experience of markets supported by farmers. Now, if you see up on the screen, you'll see our award-winning keeper up on top in the middle. We've won many awards for that. Um, and um, our soft serve and in the middle on the bottom, we have some uh, Valentine Sundays that we promoted during Valentine's Day. Um, we also up on top is part of our cheese case that we uh, um, display our cheeses in our retail store. On the bottom right, you will see our strawberry milk, um, which is pretty delicious in my eyes and um, customers love it. So this old bull sugar hasn't run out of words like an old tractor that still runs, but it's much slower these days. In 2016, I decided to retire after an unwelcome diagnosis of double breast cancer. Now, you know agriculture, a very few people ever actually retire from all aspects when you're in agriculture. We still have retired farmers that are helping on the farm during planting seasons. When I say retire, I gave up the lead reign in the business. I hired a new manager. I spent over a year training her and did eventually take over a little more time off. But still, the store, I'm at the store nearly every day. This is true today. I still do the marketing for the business and odd jobs behind the scene. Thank, thankfully, I have a new manager that is wonderful. She and I have a great working relationship, which allows me to still be active in the farm and in the store, but take some time off to enjoy other things in life. One of the huge events that happened at Weber's was Farm Technology Days in 2018. We partnered with our neighbor, Daryl and Brenda Sternwise. Family, our families played a big role in that event. We had 43,000 people attend this show. This happened because of the executive committees, all the volunteers and the family to put this to do, get this job done. And what a show it was. We had the Wisconsin Badger Band opening up the opening ceremony. Due to my medical history, my new manager handled the COVID guidelines um, outlined by the CDC. The social distance guidelines were easily implemented with the drive up service that we have and also limiting people in our store. We had the lineup of the cars during COVID was 11 cars we can fit in our, from the drive up window out to the road on our, and then 
they were on the road on the shoulder of the road past the intersection intersection some days that's when the cdc guidelines were implemented and we only limited five people in the store at at a time but we made it through and um people were very appreciative of our drive up window i am so blessed to say that i've been in remission for eight years i know how lucky i am and thank god for that daily i also know how lucky i am to have been raised on a farm and have raised my own children around the business Agriculture produces individuals that impact society and supports a community. Our community may not always understand the impact of agriculture part, but they definitely feel the impact from the business. Weber's Farm Store and the Hyman families support many agriculture events, such as dairy breakfasts, dairy food drives, fundraisers, but we know that life is more than dairy. There are other factors that impact the community and support local business organizations, such as our local Marshville Area Chamber of Commerce and youth sporting programs. I just wanna tell you, thank you for letting me give my story to you. And if there's any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Joe Ellen. Really appreciate some of those details. Um, we did have a couple of questions that were in the chat, and I think that will help elaborate on a couple of um, things in your store that people want to learn a little bit more about. One of the first questions um, was how, can you refresh us, how long have you been at A2 Herd at Hyman Holsteins? And um, how has that process added value to your products? And maybe a little bit about um, what made you decide to, to go into um, that particular, uh, you know, uh, line of thought of making a product that's the A2 milk, you know, what, walk us through a little bit of, of that. Well, I don't know if you know my husband yet, Ken. He's been on the milk marketing board for 15 years. He's worked with Dairy for Center for Research. Um, and he's always reading. And one of the things that I think promotes and helps a business is you're always keeping the customer interested. We've had A2 Protein at Weber's for over a year. Um, as you heard in my story, you know, we um, started with Kiefer in 2013. Um, we just started um, adding more flavors of milk to our milk line, strawberry milk, mint milk. A2 Protein, um, it starts with the genetic of the cow with their DNA, DNA testing. And it's just another way of promoting milk where some of the customers would make a comment, I can't drink your milk because I'm lactose intolerant. This milk doesn't give you an upset stomach. It, it, it just, um, it's just easier for people to digest and also for these lactose intolerant uh, customers that are having a difficult time, get, they can feel at ease by coming and drinking our milk. So have you, you know, with that, have you seen an influx in um, customers that are coming to the store specifically because you have the A2 milk that they've heard from a friend, colleague, something like that, um, and they come in to specifically get your product because it is the A2? Yes. I've, we've had customers that, um, and I, I do advertise, like I told you, I do some um, the marketing for Weber's, and I will advertise, you know, our new product line, our, um, and I have customers that come have came to me and said, oh my God, I can drink your milk now. 
it is a two and I, I I'm just so happy my kids are happy I don't have upset stomachs in my house anymore so I think it was a positive thing for our business Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned the marketing um, with this. Is there is there certain places that you found it helpful to target marketing to since, um, you know, there is a portion of the population that, that does have that lactose um, sensitivity? It, has there been certain places that have really helped you, um, you know, gain customers that way? Or is it more of a, a general approach? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I... I do my advertising through our Hub City Times. It's a newspaper that is still free because of uh, businesses supporting the paper that I pay a cost for my ad and I place an ad in that paper every week. I also um, advertise on radio. Um, I have several radio stations that I put uh, promote my ad on. Um, I just recently did a June Dairy Month commercial for Channel 7, and that's a local station in our area, which I felt turned out really good. Um, I'm the spokesperson for that. Um, And I, um, I thought it turned out great. Do you want me to play it to you? Yeah, if you have it, that'd be great. I do have it. Just give me a senior second and I will play that. It's a 30 second ad. Um, Let me see. I just got to find it on my phone. Give me a senior second. Here we go. Okay. Here it is. And if it's playing, we're not catching any audio yet. We pride ourselves on Wisconsin dairy and cheese there we products, go. like our Homestead A2 protein milk from Selected Cows. No need to cut milk from your diet. This milk is the cure. Try our award-winning paper that keeps you smiling. A healthy, drinkable probiotic smoothie comparable to yogurt. Manufactured only at Weber. Drive through or come inside. Weber's Farm Store, West of Marshfield. Visit our website or find us on Facebook. Could you hear that? Yeah, it was a little bit quiet, but we could hear that coming through. Yeah. Okay. And um, I also, um, we have a a Facebook page for Weber's Farm Store. Mm -hmm. And we have a website. And that is my next project is updating my website for Weber's Farm Store. I have half of it done already. Um, It is, um, I've been taking pictures also for you, but also for my webpage for Weber's Farm Store. So Mm -hmm. always promoting, always marketing. Um, Our customers know they, we have a website. They know we have a Facebook page um, and always promoting what we have. Yeah, great, great. Um, you know, you mentioned promoting um, what you have, and, and uh, we had a question in the chat that is asking, um, what process do you go through when, when you're looking at adding a new product or a new product line? How do you go about um, maybe making that decision and then working through that process of um, getting that product added? You know, um, what, what does it look like with some of those different steps that you might need to go through when you're designing packaging, all those different steps, maybe walk through some of that thought process. Well, in 2013, when we um, um, decided to um, um, try Kefir, it's a mm-hmm. European drink that um, it, it is something that we can actually, um, you know, use our milk product to produce and actually create this product. Um, It was a lot of trial and error. Um, It took us about 11 batches to actually master it. Now, when we say master, I mean, there was batches that didn't work at all and we just scratched it. With a lot of research and my husband is very good at educating himself, but also educating us as what he has found or heard or talked to. 
and he's always trying to promote something that we can add in our product line. Um, and uh, Center for Dairy Research was very good to come over to Weber's and help us master that, that product of Kiefer. Now, we didn't just, just um, Center for Dairy Re Research was a big help and our guys in the manufacturing uh, processing area also were very good at making changes when changes needed if the if it just didn't taste right. But I also did surveys for my customers. I handed out if we felt we were almost there, but not quite with our kefir product. I actually, they would create a batch and I would handle free samples with a survey. Mm -hmm. And I would ask the customer to bring that survey back. Tell me what you think. Is it too chalky? Is it too thin? Is it too thick? Is there too much sugar? Is there too much flavor? And they actually did. They brought back the surveys. And that's one of the reasons how we mastered, you know, what we needed to change. Mm -hmm. Can I interrupt when you when you went through that process with the survey and the samples? So did you basically go through the entire process of you already bottled a product and it went out with the customer and then they came Correct. back the next time? Okay. Mm -hmm. Correct. It was bottled. It was a chug, 16 ounce chug that we actually would give them. And then we would in return, ask them to return that survey. So kind um, of fine tuning the recipe. Exactly. Um, A2 protein was something my husband, from research, he said, I, I've learned about this A2, and I, I really think this would be a big hit for our customers, because we would hear customers say, we cannot drink your milk, um, and we love it, and it tastes so different to, according to the store-bought milk in mm -hmm. the plastic jugs, but my, my, my daughter gets sick, or my son gets sick, and and I, I, I believe, you know, they're having digestive problems or, you know, they just can't handle the A1, A2 milk. So that's how we got off the ground with the A2 milk. I also, when we started with, when I started with the outer milk bag, I went to my library to learn about A2. There wasn't one single book in our local library that had anything about A2 protein or A2 milk. Mm -hmm. So I asked a librarian, could you find me any information? She says, yes, I can get you a book out of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So she ordered it and I picked it up at our Marshville library and I read about it. I needed to learn what this was and I needed to understand it. And that's, and from that point on, then I started creating this outer milk bag, what needed to be on there. Um, and work with IDFA, a labeling company. So I had the right information on the outer milk bag. It was, mm -hmm. it took me a year to do the outer milk bag. To so there is a lot of design process to make sure that you get the information that you need on there. And then some of those key labeling um, points that are the kind of quick reference pieces that when you're looking at a product on the on the shelf, you're looking for key pieces of information. And for somebody that's lactose intolerant, they'd be looking for that A2 because they know that that is an indication that they're able to see or the lactose free or some of those indicator words, correct? Correct. And um, getting the right information on and the nutritional facts change. I started doing the outer milk bag and then the industry wanted um, the changes changed on the nutritional facts. So that all had to be redone. So thank God I was in the start of that process that I didn't complete it. And then the industry changed the nutritional facts. I would have to do that over again. And that's an expensive step right there. Um, you know, manufacturing an outer milk bag, having, make, creating templates and, you know, it, it took me a year. I, I have to say, I think I was so happy to complete that project.
very tedious and very uh, doing research. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you mentioned with the labeling and, and one thing with labeling, there's a lot of regulation that comes with that. Um, I know when we were talking uh, last week, you, you had mentioned that, you know, you've had some people um, come to you with questions about getting started with a, a business similar to yours. And I was curious if, if you could uh, share a little bit about, um, you know, how that conversation went and, and really kind of key in on where people should uh, look to find information about getting started because that is a big process and I know a lot of um, folks may be interested in doing something like this you know in their own area but um, it's a big process getting started so uh, what can you share on you know what that looks like because your model might look a little bit different but where should folks look to start well I think our business was very fairly lucky um, we were grandfathered in. Um, this is a, a generation business. Um, I, I would say about 10, 12 years ago, uh, one summer, I th uh, that summer, I had about 15 phone calls of people that would wanted to talk to me about the business. And I would listen and they had their story of why they wanted to and they thought, you know, you have to have a good location. We at Weber's have a good location. We're on the west side of Marshville. And like I explained in my story, we, you know, things have changed for our business. And that was one of the reasons why we didn't move the business, but we moved our milking cows to another farm so that we didn't, the, the community didn't have to put up with spreading liquid manure and uh, the equipment on the road as much. And so when, when someone would call me and ask, I would like to start a business like this. And I would let them talk. And then when they got done, I would say, okay, I'm gonna tell you that, you know, this is generations and generations for us. But if you're starting from scratch, it's totally different. I would suggest before you even talk to me, I want you to call the state of Wisconsin to find out what permits, what, what um, licenses, what do you need to actually start this business? What are the guidelines, the rules? Because they're so different than when my parents es uh, established Weber's Farm Store. Uh -huh. The rules I believe changed um, when we talked about the customer could bring their glass bottle and my mom would fill the bottle. Uh -huh. In the early 1960s or late 50s, those rules and regulations changed. That was one of the reasons why my parents purchased the glass bottles and we would disinfect and fill and cap and then it was an exchange type thing. Um, because of the rules and regulations that changed. So about 15 people that contact me, I believe there was only one that still wanted to pursue it. Now in, Wis now in Wisconsin, I could be wrong. I know there's a business up in uh, Washburn, Wisconsin, and their, bus uh, their name is Tesner's. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other people that have the same concept as us, but um, I know at one time they, it was down to two. And years back, there was many, many processors that actually process their milk like us. If you come into our retail store, we actually have a shelf of quart bottles of all the processors that used to process milk over the years in Wisconsin. And there's a lot of bottles up there. There's a hundred, I believe 170 bottles up there on the shelf. So that tells you the changes that went out on in, in this type of concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and, and for those um, that might be wondering what, um, department of that is with the state of Wisconsin um, that you need to contact that would be the Department of Agriculture Trade and Consumer Protection I believe um, and there's some folks there that that 
can uh, help you walk through some of those ideas and what those current rules and regulations are. That's always a, a great place to start. Yeah. yeah. So, Lisa, I just saw a chat come up on my screen. Mm -hmm. And Tesner's, the, the business up in Washburn. Yep. My parents actually let them use the template of the okay. outer milk bag. They are actually, and I don't know if they still are, but um, when my um, um, Tesners wanted, you know, wanted a business like ours, so my parents, the manufacturer that created the outer milk bag, uh, Tesners were using that same, same template. Mm -hmm. That was a chat that came up on my screen, and I thought, I better mention that. Yeah. And you do yeah. have that picture of that first bag that, my parents use, you have that up on your yep. screen. Jenny, could you go back to that um, slide for just a second so people can look at that again? So the one on the far left on the bottom with the milk pitcher, that's the bag that Tessner's is actually using, if they still are. I know they were. My husband and I traveled to their business about six, seven years ago because I wanted to see what they had to offer versus us. Mm -hmm. and they were still using the bag at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are there any, um, you know, products that you're potentially looking to add on the horizon or is it more diversifying flavors? How do you decide how many flavors of a product you're offering? By the customer that actually says, oh, I wish you had strawberry milk. Oh, I wish you had mint milk. Um, that we keep our ears open. We're always tuning in to what the customer says. So, um, you know, those are ways of deciding, is it gonna be uh, profitable? Is it gonna be, if we create this, because it's not only creating the, the recipe, you're also creating the label mm -hmm. and the outer milk bag. So there's expenses involved in that. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, you know, that's how we come to the realization. What does our grocery stores have? Um, if it's a new product in the industry, uh, my husband always has his ears open. You know, we, you know, let's try to create this. Let's see what we can come up with. So that's how we do it. Okay. Yeah. Um, are there any um, seasonal products that that you offer that you know you go through that process of making the label and going through that expense but then they're offered seasonally because either it makes sense or because maybe interest tapers off after a certain period is there anything like that that you're currently doing or looking to do in the future well we are doing our awesome holiday eggnog and people our customers swear by it um we started um about the middle of november and we ended about the first week in January. So why do we quit it about January 5th or 5th, 7th? Because at that point, at Christmas time, it's cookies, it's desserts, it's you're, you're, you're eating constantly, you're entertaining, you're, the calories are coming, the pounds are coming on and you're like, oh my God, by New Year's Day, you're like thinking, I got to stop eating like this. But our holiday eggnog was a recipe that we had. And it's actually our soft serve mix is part of the recipe. Now, when you taste our holiday eggnog, it's very rich and smooth. And our the customers that buy it, oh, my God, they go, this is I can't even keep it in my refrigerator. I mean, the families that buy it love it. And so we tell them, hey, we only have a short span. So if you want this to last a little bit longer, throw that plastic pouch in the freezer. You can actually freeze it. And then you'll have it just a little bit longer. We also just created our mint milk. And with St. Patrick's Day, we promoted our mint milk. And how we promoted it was, I had t-shirts done up for our retail retail staff. Milk, uh, how did it go? Milk monsters, how did it go? Milk, 
monsters is what it was. Weber's milk monsters. So no, milk ninja monster, milk ninja monsters. That's what it was. And it had green on. And that's how we were promoting our mint milk. That was the introduction of our mint milk. That will be a milk that we will bring out around St. Patrick's Day, you know, right after uh, Valentine's. And we will carry that on maybe for a month or two. And then we'll <laughs> introduce it again at the holiday season again. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, one other question. Um, you know, we had talked uh, a little bit about, <coughs> excuse me, um, you have soft serve ice cream. And I know that with the pandemic, there's been some challenges in how um, you're reaching customers. And I was curious if you could uh, tell us a little bit about um, what that process looks like with your soft serve and reaching customers during COVID. It, it just bursted at the seams. I'm going to tell you with the, um, with the COVID in our drive up window. And now we wore masks and we just discontinued wearing masks as of June 1st in our store. Um, we, oops, sorry. We also had, um, we also had a plastic shield out in front of our cash register so the customers that walked in we were we had a shield between us um with you know people being confined to their homes and um customers wanted to get out but they wanted to also follow the cdc guidelines and so our drive up service was just booming. It was, they wanted soft serve because people that know our soft serve, they love it. And cones, what, what more when you have a rough day is to come out and have a, a, a ice cream cone or a sundae or a shaker or a ripper float. Our drive up window, I'm going to explain this. Our length of our driveway, we can fit about 11 cars in from the drive up window out to the road. We have an intersection because the city cities, uh, uh, we have the city's limit is uh, the road alongside of our business. We have an intersection there. Uh, the cars were past the intersection on the shoulder of the road down the street to the church that's kinney corner from us to their parking lot driveway that's how COVID hit us and if we had the girls in the store had all they could to keep up i tell you it was unbelievable um you know and a lot of these customers wanted to follow the cdc guidelines and that was one way we could function and still keep the business flowing. I feel sorry for some of the businesses that didn't survive because of COVID. We were very lucky. We functioned and we kept on going. And we're still there. Yeah, Joel, was was the um, drive up window always part of your business and, and um, you know, or if it wasn't, how did that uh, come about as, as being part of your business? So when my parents are the founders of Weber's Farm Store, in 19, about 1960, my dad was always thinking, how can I improve? How can, just like my husband, how can I improve? What can I do to make this business succeed? How can we make changes? And my father thought, Oh, let's try a drive up window. We actually, my parents had a drive up window before McDonald's and it was very successful. Customers, elderly customers that didn't want to get out of the car, they could just go up to the window. Um, if we had a young family that had children that didn't want to unbuckle their little ones, um, they used the drive up window. If someone had surgery, 
they didn't have to get out of the car. I mean, this was a very, uh, very successful in, in the business itself. It was one of the best features my dad decided to do and my mom. Yeah. Um, and, and with your soft serve, I know you have some, um, unique, uh, flavors that go with that. You know, is there, um, is there, is there a, a, a method in which you've kind of chosen what, what flavors to offer, or is it just kind of the, the golden favorites? How, what are you, you know, doing in, in that regard? Cause I think you have some unique things there. Yes. Um, you know, listening to what other, um, other businesses that carry soft serve, also um, tweaking, finding out flavors of where, what flavors we can get from uh, the companies that we do business with. Um, what is it going to cost? Uh, what you know? Is it um, a long process as far as changing that flavor? Um, the guys in the the processing area, I have to give them credit of coming up with some of those flavors and asking questions. Not only with them coming in the store and they'll say, what do you think? What do you think of this flavor? What do you think of that flavor? Uh, we have some pretty awesome flavors. Blueberry cheesecake, strawberry cheesecake, um, we have um, orange dreamsicle, root beer, um, coffee, caramel, um, blue moon, um, what else? Uh, black raspberry, um, chalk, you know, there's all, all kinds of flavors. I could go on and on. Um, and mm -hmm. everyone that we change, it's an interesting to watch our Facebook page because we do post it on our Facebook page. My manager, um, every week when I do a, um, a change in my ad, she's making a change on Facebook for the new ad. Also, when we introduce a new flavor of the month, Ken uh -huh. is actually uh, promoting that on our Facebook page. If you look on the screen, you'll see my manager, Candy. Uh, she's got that strawberry milk with cookies in front of her. That, that day, um, we were doing National uh, Strawberry Milk Day. Um, we were promoting, we were introducing strawberry milk that day. It was like our promotional day of handing out samples to our customers. Yeah. That's great. Well, I think we're kind of reaching the end of the hour. So I think we're going to um, wrap up. Um, but I do want to thank you for your time, Joe Ellen. Really appreciate all of the insight that you've shared with us today. Um, we'd like to remind everybody that we do have uh, additional coffee chats. This is the first of three for the summer period. Um, and we've got our slide up right now that has the uh, place to register if you haven't registered for those other meetings. Um, our next one will be on July 12th, uh, Traditions Today and Tomorrow. And just a brief little bit about that, traditions are the cement that keep families together and help you withstand the storms that come. Um, join us for a lively discussion uh, discussing the importance of uh, traditions in one's family and workplace. And uh, look to hear a little bit more about that and maybe developing some of your own traditions uh, as we're emerging from COVID. Um, we'll be hearing from Nancy Vance and Karen Dickerel, um, who are human development and relationship educators uh, here in UW-Madison Division of Extension. Um, we do have a poll question up uh, just to kind of finish out the day. And then I also do want to mention um, Joe Ellen had mentioned Farm Technology Days um, a few years back, and uh, we are really lucky in central Wisconsin to have uh, Farm Technology Days kind of, uh, you know, move about, and uh, it's coming back to the kind of central Wisconsin area, albeit a little bit more to the west of where um, it was back in Marshfield um, at uh, Eau Claire County at Hunsinger Farms, uh, July 20th through 22nd. So do uh, come check that out. There's going to be some uh, 
great info there, um, really unique. Uh, those that might not know, Hunsinger Farms um, grows horseradish. So if you want to learn about horseradish, this is going to be the place to be this, this summer. So uh, do feel free to join us at Farm Technology Days. UW Extension has the educational presence there and lots of um, great info to be had. Um, some really fun things that are planned there. And with that, we'd like to thank everyone for coming and enjoy the rest of your morning. <laughs>